This conversation is to highlight the amazing and courageous Lisa May. She's the owner of Lisa May House Sitting. She's a writer, opera singer, dancer, and a global citizen. Lisa travels the world house sitting, pet sitting, and a whole lot more. Lisa May, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. And I just want to say I've admired your journey for a very long time. And so that's why I invited you here today to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you this. What part, where's a, good, where's a good place to start? And also what part of my journey was that really caught your eye? So let me first bring you back to one of the last conversations we had and I think we were at the Hamilton. Oh my God. Oh, I don't know how time ago, right? You're talking years back, girl. <laughs> On 14th Street, Washington, D.C. And, and you were getting ready to leave the United States soon after that. So, so was it 2014, 2015? It was a long time ago, right? Girl. During that time, you, you told me about your plan to travel the world. I learned that you were an opera singer. I didn't know that before that day. Yeah. Um, you probably told me then that you, you were a dancer. I didn't know you were a mother. Like I learned so much about you <laughs> on that day at the Hamilton. And I'm like, okay, I've known Lisa or I've been around you, but that was my first time actually having a real conversation about your life. And then mm -hmm. to watch you on social media as you were traveling, I'm like, wow, like she's living my best life. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's way back. I, um, when you mentioned living my best life, I was, uh, so I, I never watched a reality show until I left the country realizing that in other countries, there's like one or two American channels and one of them is always E. <laughs> and and the Kardashians on it, and people watch people watch the Kardashians like a guidebook to how to be in America. I lie to you not. And it's in English. They have the subtitles of their own language underneath. It's insane because they want to learn how to how to talk like them. Um, but I'm watching the Kardashians one day because, of course, now they got me on it because I'm just so. I am into different cultures and I'm into studying like, why do they do this? Why do they look at this? And so part of the culture was to learn my own culture through someone else's lens. Awesome. And it's like that in every single country. Everyone has a lens for an American. Everyone wants to be American. It is wild. We definitely have an ego for a reason. Um, and one of the Kardashians said, I don't know, someone asked what, the, what were they doing? And the other one said, She's just laying there by a pool in some little bikini on her Instagram. She goes, well, I'm living my best life right now. And I turned the television off. I said, I'm living my best life right now. I'm living my best life for you. So when you say that, I know exactly how you feel. Yes. <laughs> American <laughs> lens, looking at you and all these other cultures and countries. That's a very good question. Why did I even leave? Well, I had a friend of mine uh, um, who I used to work with at the Shakespeare Theater. No, we didn't work there. She worked there. I worked at a different theater. But we were both, uh, she was a box office manager and I was a theater manager. And so we used to always cross paths. And sometimes we worked together in different theaters. And one day, like we ended up just disconnecting for a while. We weren't working in the same place. And, and we lost some touch. Uh, I think one of the theaters closed down or something, the one that we worked together the most. And some time went by, a couple months went by. And she asked if she, if I could Skype with her one day. And I said, of course you can, you know. And I was just, I figured we'd catch up. And we did catch up. And little did I know, she had been living in Belize with her mother for the last year. Mm -hmm. Where she was living with her mother somewhere in Maryland, Mount Laurel or something. And I said, well, that's a long way from Mount Laurel. I said, I don't even know where police is. And so she goes on to tell me that it was her mother's idea that her mother's mortgage, it was getting to her 
or the or the condo fees or whatever it was, but something was going up, taxes on the house, whatever it was, as you know, especially during that time, those rents were raising, everybody was downsizing. And even I downsized, I went from a two bedroom to one bedroom. And then I was living in a room, which in my adult mind was like, what is happening to me right now? Like, why do I have a roommate? Like I haven't had a roommate in 20 years who wasn't my child, you know? So I, she went on to tell me that somehow her mother had caught on that Belize. And at the time she was right, this was years ago. Um, Belize was a very inexpensive place to live. And it was just lovely to live on a Caribbean island. And I think they had Caribbean in their blood of some sort. I think there was some type of Jamaican or something. Um, and just the living was just so easy. And for uh, something about the same size of her home was about the third of the price to live in on the Caribbean Sea. And at the time I still had my youngest daughter and you know how we think Americans, Americans, it, Westerners even I could say, because UK is kind of like this too. We're so stuck in the programming of society that we have to, um, it's, not, it's not really what I wanna say, but we have these responsibilities to others that actually don't exist. Mm -hmm. We're just trained to program ourselves on a regular basis that they are more important than we are. That's deep. We are trained by family, not on purpose, not because these people are mean. It just started at a certain point and went from generation to generation. It became ingrained, ingrained, ingrained that the purpose of our lives is to be enslaved by a certain society. Maybe it's the rich, maybe it's companies, maybe we're just trained to do it for ourselves. You know, maybe we're just trained to do it for ourselves as a, as a proper challenge to achieve our actual purpose in life. Because if we didn't have that constant challenge of having to override things or uh, jump over hurdles that we ourselves put there, if we knew that we could actually just take those hurdles away, I think the act of not having the challenge makes us feel like we have nothing to live for. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, you know, she had mentioned all this. And at the time I thought I had so many hurdles and responsibilities and connections and different things. And little by little, I would say it took me another two years I started to realize, and don't feel sad when I say this, but I began to realize that nobody necessarily cared <laughs> whether I stayed or left, no, really. I get, it. I get it. You know what I mean? You know, it, it, you know, there are people who like you to be there when they're feeling low and you're the person that they come to to maybe kind of get out of their thing. You know, you're the person they can talk to, you're the person, but, I never really felt like anybody noticed if I was there or not, so to speak. Right. Um, and and it, that comes from a narcissistic point of view from myself. Like I used to think I had so many friends and this and this and this. And I was like, but Lisa, who do you actually connect with? Who do you have a bond with? Who do you know you can go to? And I started to realize there was very little, very little people like that. And people that I did have like that I, I talk to very rarely, yeah. very rarely. And so at that point, when it came to the point where I said, you know what, I'm just gonna leave for the winter and I'm gonna come back. And it was because finding an apartment was so difficult. Like the, the, the rents went up three times the amount. Yeah. I didn't want a room. I wanted to live in DC. That was a very difficult situation to put together. Um, I wanted to sing opera. I didn't have a car. It's, you know, there are all these different things. And I said, gosh, this is just an awful lot. And I ended up having a, um, I, I didn't have, I was looking for work, but of course, while you're looking for work, there must still be income. Yeah. And there was no such thing as um, freelance apps. There were no freelance apps that existed. It was just Craigslist. 
And so I took a chance. I put an ad in Craigslist. I said, I'm a secretary for hire. Um, I, I made them pay, basically doubled what I would get paid at an office on a payroll. But it was still half the amount that they would have to pay to actually hire me because they wouldn't have to buy an office. They didn't have to be responsible for phones and this and that. So it was a great thing. And I had about five clients and I was working because I had roommates. I decided to work from this very, um, at the time it was an affluent pool membership that came with my gym membership, but they had free Wi-Fi there and they had these beautiful beds and I was poolside on my laptop and that's when I, where I went to work every day, every single day. So I'd go to the gym, go upstairs. They had a sauna, they had a steam room. So I would do all my like spa things. And then I'd go upstairs, very relaxed, my head in a towel, little bathing suit. And I had a gazebo during the week, the gazebos were free. So I worked from a gazebo from the pool. So that was like my first vacation, like staycation. Yeah, okay. um, I began to realize that it was gonna be winter and the pool was gonna close down because it was not indoors. And I literally had an anxiety attack, which I, I wanna say I never have, maybe I do. But I just could feel my heart and I was like, what am I gonna do? So I gotta do something, I've gotta find a problem, I gotta. And then that phone call came back to me. And I thought, I wonder if she's still there. And I skyped her right then and then, right on that pool deck. I said, are you still in Belize? She says, yeah, girl, you coming? <laughs> And I said, I think I am. I said, I don't have a passport. I guess I'll have to get one. And that's what I did um, because I wasn't making a ton of money. I wanted to make sure bills were paid. Um, everything was paid. And I think I paid for my apartment, which was a three room apartment with a jacuzzi overlooking a blue lagoon and the Caribbean sea at the same time with a patio that was gonna be my office. Um, overlooking the Caribbean Sea, 600 bucks a month, this was. So I paid out for the whole winter to have it. And, um, but I didn't have a plane ticket and I didn't have a passport yet. And by the time I got paid again and did all this, you know, pay, made sure my bills were paid and nobody was gonna be, it was gonna be the day before I left to pick up my passport. Oh my. Um, it was very expensive to go to Belize at that time. It was uh, around like eight or $900 to go to Belize at that time. However, if you went by way of Mexico, it was $300. And so my friend kind of helped me walk me through getting to Mexico, taking this bus to that bus to this bus. But I got to see all of Mexico. I went to like three different towns and then got to the border which is a little scary, I have to say. Um, I don't look back and see it as scary, but I think we just, we've watched too many movies. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Um, especially when you're coming over by bus, you, you kind of don't know what to expect. But I think the cure for that is to go by day. Just always go by day. Don't take overnight stuff, don't do that. Just go by day. You can see everybody, it doesn't look as scary. I think they do ask you for extra money here and there, um, but it's not, it's nothing for us to be worried about. It's not like, they're like, we need an extra five bucks. And, I was like, okay. and that was, you're also a woman traveling alone. So yeah. that's the part that was scary. That was really the part that was scary. See, I was prepared. Not for the worst, because I didn't. I really didn't think the worst was going to happen because too many people travel, too many people do this. Exactly. There's a lot of backpackers who don't know half as much as I know. Yeah. But at the same time, they know a lot more than I do because they're out here backpacking. Yes. And don't think anything of it. Nothing. Yeah. Um. Here's what helps. Um. I'm gonna say this out loud. Black people complain about white privilege. I feel like sometimes it's used as an excuse not to move on with your life. Um, there is black privilege while traveling beyond anything you could ever imagine. You just have to have the attitude. You just have to have the attitude of being, not necessarily being American, but as Americans, we already think we are knowledgeable. 
we already, now at home, we don't necessarily think so. We think we're uneducated, we're poor with this. You're not over there. Right. They see us as free, rich, American people of color who are properly educated. As women, you do have to be careful of that of being taken advantage of there's a little sexualness it's it's really not like if you feel like you're being approached you can be like excuse me sir and then step right back yeah because they see you as the person of a higher level okay. that being said when you walk in as a single woman and they find out you're traveling alone they think you're independently wealthy because no woman exists on earth without a man to handle her business. So if you have no man, then you must be independently wealthy. So that part you have to kind of look at and see that people are grooming you to, to you know, be, they want to be taken care of. They see you as a sugar mama. Now- Do you reveal to people that you're American or do you try to conceal that as you're traveling? Or does it just, is it just obvious to other people that you are not a part of that culture? Now, obviously if you're in Europe and you're, I guess they're African Europeans, but do you just stand out and people know, oh, you're different. And then you open your mouth and they're like, oh, she's American. How, they, how do you they don't think I'm different. They think I'm a little bit of a higher level maybe they think, oh, she must have a really good job. Oh, she must, you know, and they do see me coming from America, but most, especially like Central American countries, they think I'm from that country. Okay. Until I open my mouth. Right. So the bottom line is you learn that language, you learn their diction, they just assume you're from there. Even if you're like, if you go to Colombia and you're from, Pan you know, and I speak, if I speak in a Panamanian dialect, They'll take it. So I would say I learned, I learned, I nailed, that's not true. I, I was 40% fluent in Mexico. Um, as you go to different countries, the dialect is different. So they may have the same language, but the dialect is remarkably different. So it's a little tough to pick up. I just stayed very quiet for the first couple days and I listened to how they're speaking. Um, and your visuals, like when you're on vacation, this is difficult, but if you're constantly traveling and staying in other places and always someplace else, your body adjusts, your senses adjust. So you start picking up on nonverbals immediately. You see visuals immediately. So you know what's going on in the room, even though you don't understand what the language is. Okay. And little by little, they're repeating things. They're repeating things. And it's like a little song. And so it's, and I do, you know, I do have this knack of, um, I don't read music at all. So I learn operas by ear, all of it in other languages. So I can hear a language. I may not know what it is, but I can mimic what they just said. So for example, in Morocco, Morocco's hard. Morocco is hard. Um, it's easier if you're a person of color, but clearly if you're not wearing wraps, you're not from there right. and they are on you um, in all ways, in all ways. It's crazy. Um, there are easier places in Africa to go. You don't have to be in Morocco. You can go to Fez and have the same and see the same thing. Um, and I just thought to myself, how am I going to do this? How am I going to walk down the street? Like these guys are like on me. Um, and there was a white woman in front of me. It turns out she was French. So one thing about Morocco is it used to be a French owned colony. It's only recently become independent. So when it comes to France, you can be any color you want. I can still be French if I wanna be. And so this woman spoke in French cause the guy was like really on her. And she said, merci, no, 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 merci, non. And she walked away and the guy just walked away. He just disappeared into a tent and went away. And so I just started doing that. And that was the only thing I knew how to say. It's not a place where you can just drop yourself and then kind of look around unless you know Arabic, yeah. you are a person of color or you know French, something, something. 
Um, I was lucky. I met up with a couple of uh, a guy from Argentina and a guy from Spain. They were a little more, you know, Europeans are a little more know how to get around or whatever. They knew a little bit of Arabic, but the fact that they were men was like enough. Yeah. So they were really sweet and they used to come to me in, in my room and they would go, we're going to go out for a walk. Do you want to go out for a walk with us? I was like, yep. <laughs> Get my, I got my moo moo together. <laughs> that went all the way. <laughs> I was like, let me get my moo moo. I'll be right back. <laughs> that's how I, that's how I ended up doing Morocco. Oh, okay, so Belize was your first. That was my first country. Really, Mexico was because I came through right. Mexico, hung out, and then I went to Belize. Right. Um, I rented from this really uh, adorable couple from. I want to say they're from Iowa. I always get Iowa and Idaho. Confused. Um, but I think it's Iowa. And their dream was to move to Central America and to start a, a home building flipping uh, business. And so that's what they did. And they started building, they had one resort, sort of resort. Their house is basically a resort and they have an extra cottage to the side of the pool. And her husband built the whole thing and did this whole thing. And then that was on the mainland. And then they went and started building another really large piece of property. So I rented from them and I stayed for about two months. And so they said to me, they said, you know, we have this other piece of property. And the problem is they have one property that's on an island that you have to take an hour long ferry to. And, and it's, it's not very easy. It's not a hop, skip and a jump to get back to their main home. And so they have dogs on this side. They have a cat on this side. And it's just them as a couple. Somebody's got to stay at both places. So they were never having a chance to actually see each other. Yeah. And they were like, we would like to take a vacation. <laughs> she said, we already have someone for this apartment. Could you stay at our house? And um, as opposed to pay for another month's rent on this place. And I was like, sounds like a good idea to me. I'll do it. And then their friends emailed me and said, hey, we're in Guatemala. If we paid for your bus ride down, would you watch our animals at our place? And it just kept going on like that. And I ended up going all through Central America. I went to Panama City, um, Colombia. And then from Colombia, I think I went to LA. Someone was in Hollywood and wanted me to watch their two, uh, they had two Airbnbs in Hollywood. And so I kind of flipped beds for a little while, but that's when I first started kind of making money doing this. Yeah. And then from there, I got a gig in London and then I decided I wanted a little bit of a break. And so I got a place in um, Portugal um, and it was really, it was like, they call it a hostel, but it was a mansion. A mansion. It was very, oh, I can tell you it was very well done. But the rooms were huge, vast rooms with these big French doors overlooking, you know, you're right dropped in the city, $12 a night. They did your laundry, they cleaned your room every day, changed your sheets every day. Um, fresh bread and fresh olive oil from the grow because they make olive, olives in Portugal. These are like backyard olives so and the wine was like backyard wine people made so the wine was free the bread was free um the olive oil was free so that was like throughout the day if you got munchie yeah and there was like complete breakfast included eggs bacon yogurts cereals the coffee yes <laughs> and all this stuff and then there was a happy hour at eight o'clock more wine, no, homemade sangria from the number one, uh, uh, Cerro Bal is, uh, is like a beach south, south Portugal, beautiful beaches. But what they have there is a port of their own and it's the number one port in the world. It's almost like a liqueur, it's like a dessert port. So they use that to make the sangria. Okay. With their own fresh fruit, they have fresh strawberries, fresh oranges, all the all this stuff is from the tree. They put that in the sangria, eight o'clock at night, and they have this chorizo table barbecue with this 
pottery sort of stove that they put some sort of alcohol in, they lit it up, they make the chorizo, they bring out the rest of the bread, they bring out the rest of the olive oil and everyone's chatty family style around the table. And you could either go to bed after that or they have, um, they have these tourist walkers that give free walks kind of for tips around town. Well, they would come up and invite anyone who wanted to, to do bar crawls. So you could actually kind of see the nightlife that's going down. So those who were younger, you know, or really came to have like good time, they would be gone. And it would be just enough time for you to go to bed and sleep in a quiet room by yourself (laughs) in a mansion. (laughs) And that's, and I did that for about eight months. Wow. And I worked from there. And I could go, the river was right across the street. There were trains that would either take me to Spain, Southern Portugal, any beach I wanted to. I could go to the wine country, the port country. Um, I could go to the airport and go to France and be in France inside of two hours, 50 bucks. France wasn't 50 bucks, but what so? <laughs> I went back and forth to London. I had meetings, my office was in London, but I used to live in Portugal. And I'd go visit the office every six weeks for meetings and graduations and things like that. Okay, what did I miss? Where, what is this job you have during this time? So, <laughs> so I was doing the secretary thing for quite some time. Right, you mentioned um, that. For a couple years. You I want to say maybe two years <laughs> I did that. Um, and it was so it was so cheap to live that I started letting clients, like letting my problem clients go. I just thought, why do I even have this client? I didn't need this client. So I'd let them go. And then I would have had like one client who hung on for dear life. And then um, I started getting involved with a group, an entrepreneurship group. And it really was just a group for about, I don't know, a year or two. And the person who started it, became a real social influencer. And he started to build a business on it. And everyone loved the sort of lifestyle inspiration webinars he would give and little discussions and group discussions that he built a course off of it. And so people were starting to take the courses and to sort of boost, like an idea to boost up marketing on these courses to kind of get the word out, he had a scholarship competition. And he said, the person who, uh, you know, basically it's why do I want this class? And he said, whoever has the most likes on Facebook or on social media, any social media, whoever has the most likes and whatever and shares or whatever wins the scholarship. So a lot of people were doing sort of the, um, it's just sort of the teary-eyed, oh, if I could run a business and be able to be a social media, I would be able to pay for my, you know, this and whatever. It's not even like they were paying for surgery. It would just be like, oh my goodness. And I just thought, this is kind of a rock and roller thing to do. And so I made a rock and roll video out of it. And I was like, this is who I am. These are the skills I need. This guy's going to teach me these skills, you know, vote. And this is how you vote. Cause back then people were just like, I don't even know how to like a video. Like, I don't even know how to do that. I was like, this is how you like this and blah, 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 blah. So I end up winning. Never had to pay. I remember that. I go through I the course. Do I remember that? Was that on Facebook also? It was on Facebook. I put it out there. I'll, I'll send it to you again, but it was, re- it was really fun. It was really fun. I, was, I think I just had a knack for doing something like that as well, which I never, I would have never guessed in a million years. i have never, never touched Twitter in my life. I was like, I'm not going on Twitter. I'm not doing that. I'm not, what's Instagram? I don't know what Instagram is, you know, all this kind of stuff. YouTube, make a YouTube video. I'm not going on YouTube. Somebody's gonna take my head and put it on some girl. And so I ended up doing it and just became fearless just by doing that, becoming fearless in so many other categories um, that it just ended up being a gateway into doing other things and to making sort of risk-taking decisions that I realized thinking that it, it was no risk. It was just a decision. 
And as I did, I think I did one or two courses and the groups kept building and building and building. So I was like one of the original members of this group. Um, and then I would say I did maybe a year of that. And then they promoted me to director of this academy that came out. And that was a lot. <laughs> so that it just happened over time as I traveled. And I got hired online. Like, so How would you get these house sits? Um opportunities now it's way easier at the time it was word of mouth this was also the beginning of people doing um i don't know if they paid at the time but doing that paid sort of the paid posting where you know your post would get up there and would be sponsored so to speak i don't think you had to pay at the time but that boost posting was just beginning these two young women had been house sitting for a year and a half and they were living rent-free and they did a video in Costa Rica in front of the beach saying, we've been living rent-free for a year and a half by house sitting. So when they data mined the word house sit, that video popped up immediately when I went back onto Facebook, immediately. And I was like, who are these chicks? And how are they living rent-free? I was like, that's the kind of world I'm talking about. I was like, that's the life I'm talking about. I clicked on that and I was like, they're cute. I wanna be cute. Where is this? I'm going there. And they started, again, social media influencers. They had not planned any of this. They just said, let's just put it out there. We've already done all these house sits and we have all this knowledge about how to avoid certain things. How they, so they had kind of like a little playlist. Here's what you do. Start here. Here's a, here's a template on the certain references that you need. This is what your references have to look like. And they don't have to be house sitting references. They could be the, so there were all these little tricks of the trade that they put together in about seven, eight videos, YouTube videos. And there were house sitting platforms that were just starting out. So no one really knew about them. And I mean, it taken our age into consideration. If you saw a house sitting platform for the first time where it's like someone will come to your house from another country and come watch all your things right. and your animals while you're away for two to four weeks. I don't know about that. I don't know if I'd be into that. But so the platforms were having a hard time marketing this concept. So what they did, so you couldn't really get, they couldn't get anyone, they couldn't get homeowners to join in and they couldn't get house sitters to join. They couldn't get anyone to understand the concept. So basically these women said, if you join our group, we'll teach you the ins and outs of the whole thing. And um, we'll give you free membership to these new house sitting platforms where owners will see you. And then you can see what their, you know, what their needs are and you can connect with them. So it's like a dating site, except for homeowners and house sitters. And so it was offered, so it was $99 for all this information, plus this private Facebook group of house sitters only. Yeah. And so we could then exchange information about house sitting platforms, review certain homeowners or certain situations, or just trade, just say, this just happened to me. And here's what I did, you know, things of that nature. Um, and there was a lot about travel. People who were going to different countries and crossing the border, things that were not being promoted in the media, you know, things that were happening at the border, some of that stuff doesn't get put out in the media. Or if the media says, oh my God, there's an outbreak of whatever that's happening in this country, someone from that country would post and say, there's nothing going on. I don't know why they're saying that. We're all fine. There's no deaths. There's no this, blah, blah, blah. Whatever it was they would say, or they would report that certain borders were having problems. They were having problems at certain borders and now they're requiring X, Y, Z information, even though it's not on their website. This is what I just got asked. This is how I was just treated. And so therefore you could kind of plan based on this information of where you're gonna go. So that's another thing about um, me being single and going from border to border. A lot of times, I could find out information from personal experiences within that group. 
So that was really helpful. Yeah. Um, so that's how it really got started. 85 to 90% of my house sits are word of mouth. Once I got to America again, like, I don't know, what was it, six, seven, eight years later, whatever it was, um, now there are all these apps and now people pay. Like they pay, it's insane. And so I didn't actually have to get an apartment until March of last year. <laughs> I had house sits on top of house sits on top of house sits. And so I was not only getting paid for my services to care for the home and the pets, but I, I didn't have to pay rent. Yeah. The entire time I've been in America this whole time. Um, before we close, is there anything, although what you just said was absolutely great advice for people, but anything in addition to that, that you'd like to leave with people and then also share your social media platforms if you want to share that with people so that they can follow you. Absolutely. Um, Wagner Girl. Is that on At Instagram? Wagner Girl on, on Facebook. On Facebook. Instagram is Wagner Girl to go. I just don't post that much there, but I am there. If you send me a message, I'll find it. I'll get it. Um, but on Facebook, I am Wagner Girl. And I'm also Lisa May. It just may be Ms. Lisa May. Yes. I it's, everything is in the scraps of the beginning. I'm literally starting from scratch again. Um, but that's who I am. Okay. And um, I post a lot on Facebook and I will post more on Instagram as time goes by. Um, and I would just say that um, you are the most valuable person in your life. Um, and you can't think that that is being full of yourself or any of those things, all those things are lies. You are valuable. Everyone is valuable, but there's only one you and there's only one person who can take care of you, which is you. So if you buy a Lexus car, that car is very valuable and you're gonna do everything, take it to car wash every three weeks and take it, this and it. You are very valuable. You are more valuable than that Lexus yeah. because you made that Lexus come in your driveway. You gotta keep thinking like that. Very good. It was great to be here. I'm really glad to have this conversation. I haven't done one of these in forever. Well, I am, I'm truly grateful that you have given me so much time and have shared so much information. I really, I still admire your life. Um, I don't think you're living my best life anymore. I'm going to be living my own best life. <laughs> That's right. Take, take the reins. Take the reins. I look forward to con connecting again. Like, let this not yes. be our last time. Absolutely. I definitely think like we should check in again after a year or so and see, see what happened. That would be see great. See where you went, see where I went. 